the same pirates who are suspected in connection with the disappearance of the Navy's highly classified prototype stealth submarine. And a further development, we now have unconfirmed reports that the metahuman dubbed by social media as the Aquaman was responsible for this daring rescue. Russian That's not me. Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is Wait, You Haven't Seen? It's a show where we talk about movies, and specifically, we talk about a movie at least one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. This is episode number 256, and our movie this week was 2018's Aquaman, here to talk with me about it because he hadn't seen it, from Joystick and Mouse. It's Diddy. How you doing? Good. How about yourself, bud? Not too bad. Not too bad. You know, I'm busy, but in a good way. So that's, uh, I yeah, like that. I hear you. Okay. So you hadn't seen Aquaman and I think you brought it up to me because you were like, well, the new one's out and I want to watch that, but I should watch the first movie. Um, so what kind of history do you have like with the movie, but also the character of Aquaman? Are you a DC comics guy? Were you more Marvel? Do you like comics at all? Oh, he's definitely a DC guy back in the day when comics came out and I was reading them as a kid I was definitely as, you know, a, uh, Superman, Spider-Man, DC person. Gotcha. Um, so, and, and I saw that I, uh, Aquaman was um, in, I just had watched the Snyder Cut of um, Justice League not too long ago. Okay. And was intrigued by, always liked Aquaman, so wanted to watch the new movie that's coming out and said, well, you know what? I better go back and watch the first one. Yeah. Um, so... When it comes to comic book based movies, you really the the big two are the DC and the Marvel. There's a bunch of smaller ones. You get some of those independent right. ones which come along here and there, but those are the two big ones. And Marvel has kind of eaten DC's lunch uh, in terms of movies overall. I mean, The Dark Knight and that trilogy of Nolan films is sort of on a different level, but like in terms of sort of overall audience reactions, it's typically MCU movies. Uh, do fairly well until recently. And a lot of the DC stuff hasn't. Um, but overall, after getting done watching Aquaman for the first time and having having seen him pop up in Justice League, because he has, he has like a cameo in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. And yeah, then... Very small. Yeah, and then a bigger role in, in Justice League. What did you think of his standalone movie? So fortunately, I went into this without, I don't want to say without a lot of expectations, but I definitely knew sort of what to expect. Mm -hmm. And um, I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't, it wasn't horrible. It wasn't, you know, bad. Um, and I actually thought it was pretty good. Not, not, um, it, it, it's a good, you know, popcorn movie. It's yes. Good, you know. Just sit and enjoy and and have a good time with it. And as long as you weren't expecting, you know, Shakespeare, you were it was pretty good. That's kind of how I felt about it. I enjoy it. Um, I think it's well done. I think of the DC movies, it it and the first Wonder Woman are probably my two favorites. Um in terms of like the DC EU type stuff. The, the, their connected stories. But I think a lot of that is the tone in this was a lot more fun. It wasn't quite as uh, dour. And so I enjoy I, that. I think that had a lot of, I think they had a lot to do with, with uh, Momoa himself. Oh yeah. Um, and, and also sort of the, I, I think they took that tact with it, which was a better tact than the dark and gritty, that they tried to pull off with a lot of the other DC movies. And honestly, a lot of DC movies have been pretty bad. I mean, other than, you know, a couple of the Batman movies, um, even some of the Batman movies have not been that great. <laughs> um, other than, other than the dark Knight series, they've, they've been pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, some of the stuff like green lantern was a mess and it's unfortunate because like, I like Martin Campbell as a director. Mm -hmm. I think he's great. He directed, uh, That's one of, of my favorite characters too. It's Green yeah. Lantern. 
Green Lantern is is a really interesting character, and there's a lot of cool stories to tell there. And Martin Campbell has directed two of my favorite Bond movies, but that movie itself was just a, just a mess. Um, I agree with you 100 percent, though. Jason Momoa as Arthur Curry was a great choice because he just has it was that, perfect. He has that charisma, right? You just you just like him. He's mm-hmm. you can tell he's having fun and that he enjoys being this character and doing this kind of stuff. Um, he's got a great look. I liked that. Um, I read that where he was a little, he wasn't sure about getting cast initially because classically in the comics, um, Aquaman was a, you know, blonde haired, fair skinned right. Atlantean, yeah. uh, much looking much more like Patrick Wilson who plays King Orm in this, um, mm-hmm. which by the way, the, uh, the hair, for Patrick Wilson when he's got it all slicked back and kind of tucked into whatever that little fin was in the back of his head. That's a choice. Not one that I would make, but it's a choice. Um. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh. if, I could, if I could slick it back and put it in a fin, <laughs> I might. <laughs> fair. That's fair. Um, but I did like that um, Zack Snyder had said that he wanted to cast Momoa as Aquaman because it made sense to kind of break the shackles of like, we can't have, we can't just do what's on the page. We need to do a character that can fit a little bit more. And then you, you cast Jason Momoa and then have his father cast as uh, Tamara Morrison. So you've got a Hawaiian and a Maori Mm -hmm. um, and they're very Polynesian and Polynesians. There's a lot of the sea and the ocean is part of their culture. And so it really made sense to me seeing that I, I liked that i thought that was a really cool way to go about it and like i said jason momoa is just cool looking plus dude is huge he is like he looks Big like a superhero me. yeah um i've never thought that the aquaman character quite fit the look if you know him yeah. even in the comics i never thought that was was a good choice for a character that is supposedly of the sea you know, it, it, you would have been dark skinned and you would have been, you know, you know, more of an island, you know, a, a nature type yep. of, of person. That feels a lot more authentic to sort better. of, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, Aquaman was devised, what, in the, I think the first Aquaman comics were like the 50s, maybe? 50s, late 50s, early 60s? So, I get it. 50- like the... Yeah, you know when you're yeah. making it, it, yes, you write and you then, draw what you know, and that's just kind of how it yeah. goes. If you look at most of the comics from back then, they're you know white male. You know there was no no women um, superheroes or or anything like that. So yeah, it took a while. Sign of the times, right? Okay, 1941 was the first appearance of Aquaman. More fun comics wow. number 73. Really. So Aquaman? that makes even that makes even more sense. Wow. He kind of because that makes a lot more sense too. And it and it makes sense, right? Because you got Aquaman was in more fun comics, and then it was similar time when Namor was um, kind of getting his start at whatever became Marvel Comics. Did you get a lot of those those characters come along that are very similar, right? It's like uh, right. Doom Patrol yeah. and the X Men come along around the same mm. time and all that kind of stuff. So I get that, um, but yeah, I hundred percent agree that the blonde haired Aquaman in the comics never fully fit. I get it and it's fine and it is what it is, but I just love this look. And I like the, you know, the, the very Island Polynesian style tattooing all over Jason Momoa. Some of those are his real tattoos and some of them were added on. And I loved Mm -hmm. even the detail of Thomas Curry in the movie, having that same tattoo on his forearm. You catch that in a couple of, a couple of shots. Yeah. That's very cool. And Tamara Morrison is great. I love him, right? I mean... He was very good. Yeah. Everyone knows him as Django yeah, Fett. Yeah, he he's a good actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then eventually Boba Fett and all that kind of stuff in the Star Wars universe. But he's been around. I mean, he's been acting forever. And from the trivia, yeah. again, IMDb trivia, always a grain of salt. But uh, apparently <laughs> Jason Momoa actually was was behind or or lobbied for him as casting... Uh, Tamara Morrison for his father because he was kind of an acting hero of his is what uh, what I read. Oh, I 
which is I pretty cool. I hadn't seen that. But... Oh, it um, makes sense. And they have a great chemistry. They're, that scene of them in the bar early on uh, is great. Because they, they give that real good, like, chummy father and son type thing. You can tell that's a that's a father-son relationship that works really well. They get each other. Um, yes, they were I, they were good together. What, what's, mm-hmm. um, they, those two had chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Momoa and Amber Heard, not as much. Um, I didn't... <sighs> I didn't find her terrible. Like she was fine, but the chemistry with Jason Momoa wasn't there. So I never, I didn't buy the, the romance that was the budding romance between the two of them. And the movie Mm -hmm. really spends a lot of time with that. Um, And so that, that was a bummer. So I have that down as my biggest gripe about the whole movie (laughs) is that there was absolutely no chemistry between Momoa and her. Just none. And, um, and even, even her, I have this thing about actors that you can tell they're acting Mm -hmm. and she's one of those people you can tell she's acting. Um, and there were just, there were so many things about her character and, and the best thing about her character was her fight scenes. (laughs) And that I was really taken aback by her. And and it's unfortunate because she should be a stronger character. I kept thinking the whole time I was watching what I should be seeing somebody like, not necessarily her, but somebody like a Scarlett Johansson in the role of Mira um, would have yes. been a good choice. I mean, there's a lot of other choices you could have made, uh, quite obviously. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I kept just kind of wanting a little bit more. And again, she's not terrible she's certainly not unwatchable but it just wasn't quite like for the the contrast being Momoa so natural in his performance as Arthur and you can see there's a right. good bit of Jason Momoa in Arthur Curry um mm-hmm. and it just felt like Amber Heard was doing too much because this movie is very exposition heavy uh, I would say there's a lot of moments of dialogue that are delivering of the story, right? Willem Dafoe is Volko, who I love. Willem Dafoe True. is great, yeah. but a mm-hmm. lot of his great. is delivering that exposition and telling either telling Arthur and by extension us as the audience backstory. Um, but there's an earnestness to Willem Dafoe in his performance that I buy it. Same thing with like Patrick Wilson as King Orm. I love Patrick Wilson. Mm-hmm. He's he's very good. He's saddled with a lot of, you know, bombastic dialogue and very procla a lot of proclamations and things like that. But he pulls it off well because he has a charisma that he can make that work. Um, I just she didn't quite have it. And I don't know if it wasn't enough time or if she's just not yeah, I, that good of an actor. I don't know. Um, I don't know either. I I think she's fairly well respected in other other genres. Mm-hmm. I just didn't feel like she fit in this one, and 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 I I thought she was actually poor in the movie. And the there thing were a of- lot of times where she took me out of the movie. She pulled me out, and I could just see like she's acting this this scene. Yeah, and I wonder if it's it, it all comes down to that chemistry. If you are the the lead opposite, um, you know, you're the you're the second lead. You've got to have chemistry on screen with someone like Momoa mm-hmm. and Patrick Wilson. Their chemistry was great. Like they had definitely had chemistry. And and it's you know it's obviously it's meant to be adversarial, but so so there's that part of it. But there's also like there is a respect underneath there from those two characters, like more Mm -hmm. so from Arthur, Arthur had some respect for Orm, at least in terms of like, I wanted to meet you, but then I found out what you really like. And, but that worked. Those two worked well together. Like they, they, they did that. Sorry, you're a jerk. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I loved, Um, and I had forgotten completely. I loved Dolph Lundgren as King Nearest. I liked that casting Mm -hmm. um, because it was cool to see him in a big budget movie like this again. Yeah, I I thought the 
the relationship between um, between Aquaman and Storm was done very, very well. I thought that had just the right amount of familiarity mm -hmm. and tension that those that brother half brothers would have towards each other, especially growing up separately. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really well acted between the two of them. And I thought the storyline itself was really good along those lines. Yeah. I, my biggest gripe, and I'm curious what you think about this. I think, because this movie is two hours and 23 minutes long. And I think my biggest gripe mm -hmm. is it's a little too long and it's a little bit overstuffed. There's just a little too much they tried to cram in here. And, and my issue is the stuff with Arthur and Orm and Atlantis um, versus the surface and all of that was really interesting, really compelling. I think there's, you could have gone even deeper into like the whole brothers thing and, and all of that, like in terms of their characters and Orm trying to gather up the tribes, basically the kingdoms in order to appease their laws to attack the surface. Manta though, while looked cool and Yahya Abdul-Mateen mm -hmm. too, like he's great. He's perfectly cast. He looks very he's, good. He's a great presence. I think his character wasn't needed because we had him in the beginning in the sub. And then that one little scene where Orm comes up and is like, all right, well, here's your money. And then leaves, you know, yeah, you were working with me. Here's your money. And then takes off and then comes back to him later mm -hmm. just so we can have that action sequence in Italy. And then he's forgotten about until the end of the movie. I feel like if I were editing this, I would have cut I would have had him in the beginning because I think the stuff at the beginning with him and his dad and the piracy and taking over the sub and the first action sequence with where Aquaman shows up, gets on the sub, beats the crap out of him, all that kind of stuff. I think that is interesting. And I think that stays because it's it's Arthur getting kind of becoming Aquaman in a way. And he needs to have that whole situation where he lets someone die because he's a little, he's not a hero yet. He's acting somewhat mm -hmm. heroic, but he's not really a hero yet. He's just, he's kind of self-serving in it. Um, but I would have saved and let Manta have like a, either a post credits or something of, Hey, by the way, here's some technology or he finds some technology or something along those lines. Because I do think the, the action sequence in, Italy was it sort of brings everything to a halt because we're moving along our story is it takes us an hour and 15 minutes to get to the adventure portion of this movie where they're finally going to Africa right. and going to the Sahara yeah and so to have that and they start to do their thing and you get you get Arthur and Mara finding the deserters and then going to Italy and finding the bottle thing and it, it's very um and I think even um James Wan said there was uh, influence from Raiders of the Lost Ark and Romancing the Stone, and it's it's giving that feel. Yeah, it it had that vibe all over it. But all that's going on, and then all of a sudden we bring that to they we grind that to a halt to have them fight Manta and some commandos in Italy, to then have five minutes of them on a boat before another action sequence with the trench. We could have cut that whole action sequence out and gone right to the trench stuff. And I think pacing wise, it might have worked a little bit more. Now I'm nitpicking. Right, I'm I'm talking about a movie that I feel is, if I were to give it a grade on a scale of ten, it's like a seven, seven and a half. It's good. It's very good. It's very enjoyable. Yeah. Um, it just gets a little probably bit, a fair grade for it. Yeah, it just gets a little bit long, and like it it doesn't take away from the character of Manta to just have him in the beginning. He gets a great action sequence, and then you tease it at the end that he's gonna he's not go he isn't gone. Because the other part of it is he's not an Atlantean. So how did he survive right. the end of that fight with Momoa? He fell how far and right. slammed into a rock. That dude should be like, mm -hmm. his bones should look like gravel. Um, so that's my only real, I hadn't, real complaint. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, but that definitely would have been... That actually might have been a better movie if they'd have just cut all that out. I agree with you. 
And then they could have teased that at the end with, you know, um, with, with, uh, the doctor and, and, the, and him, yeah, you know, and, and somehow they're working, they found the technology and are working on it right. somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, now that I think about that and you could have cut half an hour of the movie and it would have been probably the perfect length. Because it would have moved along a little snappier. I mean, again, the casting is mm -hmm. great, but we know nothing about him as a character other than he's a pirate. I mean, right. when he gets that suit of armor and the weapon from Orm, he immediately takes it all apart to rebuild it and repaint it. And it's like, okay, so he's a pirate, but he's also an engineer, I guess. Like, right. But yeah, I, mean, I think that would have worked better if they'd have brought the engineer in <laughs> yeah. to help him. Like, I don't need, I, I don't need necessarily to have everything spoon fed, but like, I, we went from we went from A to Q, and we jumped a whole bunch of steps there. And in terms of like learning who this character is, so again, that's that's my complaint. And it, I, I understand like you want to have. Plus, it's too many villains. It's the it's the Spider Man three issue of too many characters in there. Right. Yeah. We only need one 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 bad guy mm -hmm. in the movie. Um. You know. And and the uh, and it it's it's you know his half brother this time around. Yeah. And if you need that that mini boss, that because basically Manta becomes a mini boss, right? Where Aquaman's right, got to get yeah. through him to keep going. You had that character in Captain Merc, the the kind of right hand man, the one that gets his hand cut off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you could you could have done that with with the troopers and yep. Uh, he, and you still could have had a mini fight scene there. Sure. In in Sicily, or, it was in Sicily, right? Um, yeah. You still could have had that with, you know, the the henchman and and the captain. Yeah, we didn't need you it. Could, to you be could have Manta. done it that way. You didn't need it to be Manta. And and I, but like I say, and I would still. And... Yeah, but I would still have kept everything they did in the beginning with on the sub, and Manta and his father, yeah. and how that all played out because that is really interesting, and that gives us the slightly selfish Arthur that can then grow from that later on. And it gives Manta the motivation to come back at him later when he's got the technology. So, yeah, it's just right. that's me. Because, again, he's great. Yaya Abdul-Mateen was fantastic uh, in his limited time and what he was given to work with. Um, but I really think, like, I'm with you. Amber Heard is the weakest of this cast because Nicole Kidman uh, was a ton of uh, fun as... Wow. I was actually surprised at how good she was, um, especially in the fight scenes. And then, in, I mean, we knew she could act with, you know, the regular scenes. But sure. Um, but yeah, and her action scenes were, were actually really well done. I was actually surprised at how good they were. And that is something this um, movie. You get, oh, go ahead. You get this, you know, this woman who, you know, shows up and then all of a sudden she's, you know, the loving wife. And then all of a sudden she's kicking the crap out of the, you know, <laughs> the guards that show up. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the opening for this, because that's another thing, right? It's sort of an origin story. So you get a, it, it, but but you could, you could have done the origin story that they did. And if you cut the Manta stuff out, you're right. You lose about the 20 minutes or so of that. You got a two hour movie. Everything paces along well, because that mm -hmm. opening, I love the opening. Where she's washed up on shore. Great. Yeah. Thomas finds mm -hmm. her. It's funny when she's like grabbing the goldfish out of the fish tank and eating it. And he's just standing there with two mugs of mm -hmm. tea like, I was going to make you some eggs. <laughs> um, and all of that, <laughs> that whole sequence is great. Um, it really sets up that love story uh, between those two, which is very reminiscent of uh, oh, uh, Splash. That's what it reminded me of. Yes. It's like the mermaid mm -hmm. love story. Yeah. Um, all yeah. of that was, was a lot of fun and it was a great way to open it up. Um, and then we get to, to meet Arthur. The movie does suffer a little bit from that origin story thing of, we've got to go back and, and see him growing up, which isn't bad because I think those were fun it's not sequences. Terrible. It, um, it's not like, so I don't have a problem with this one because we haven't seen this one before. Sure. Um, the problem with the Batman ones is we've all seen it. Yeah. 37 times before, right? When we've seen the Batman yeah. origin story. We know how Batman becomes Batman. We don't need to see that again. This one's sort of new. Just, okay, you've done it. Don't do it again. And it's it's we, we why... Got it. 
Yeah, it, it's why like the the Batman with Robert Pattinson from last year, two years ago, worked so well because it was an early Batman story that wasn't trying to retell the same story we've heard. We got a little right. different glimpse. Yes. We got that glimpse of him. He's he's he becomes Batman by the end of it. But at the start, he is mm-hmm. he's the Batman, but he isn't Batman yet. He's still figuring that out. So that's a good way to do an origin story, especially right. one we've seen so many times before. It's why like Spider-Man Homecoming was a good way to do that because you're introducing a character into your universe. Audiences know we've seen his origin now, you know, in two major movies. We don't need to see mm-hmm. that part of it all again. We can jump ahead while still introducing this character. And so they sort of did a little bit of both here. They just jump ahead and sort of introduce Arthur, but then we get those uh, scenes where we flash back to him practicing on the beach with Volko, which I will say looked good. And the de-aging on Willem Dafoe, very good. Excellent. Yeah. Because that de-aging stuff can, especially this is 2018, so they're working on this 2017, 2018. So it's five years ago. Um, almost six years ago now that they're doing this, which makes a big difference. We, cause we've seen this de-aging technology really come a long way. If you did, did you see Tron legacy? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. and, and Tron legacy phenomenal. I love Tron legacy. I think it's a really well done movie. Um, I think it's an interesting movie, but it was, that was like 2010 and they just didn't have the tech quite where it needed to be yet to lose some of that uncanny Valley. So the, the younger Jeff goal, uh, Jeff bridges gets a little plasticky looking just a little bit. Um, this, Mm -hmm. I bought it. I completely bought the Willem Dafoe DH stuff. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. It was very good. And he is somebody who has a very unique look. Like when you see Willem Dafoe, you know, it's him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You can't it's fake one that. of those people, right? Yeah, there are um, a few like that, but yes, he's one of them. Mm-hmm. So I, I very much enjoyed that. Um, and uh, but like a lot of the visuals too in the fights, you know, that opening fight scene with Nicole Kidman and the the troopers in the house. Um, mm-hmm. It's a great one one take, and uh, James Wan is good at those. Um, he, I remember yes, him he doing. He did one, and it was. I was probably three quarters of the way through the shot before I realized it was a single take in the first Conjuring movie. Um, and I don't oh. know, I don't <clears> know <throat> if you've watched any of those uh, or not. But I have not. Um, my my wife is not a big horror fan, so I yeah. sort of have to watch those by myself. <laughs> the The amazing thing about the Conjuring movie, especially that first one, is it is PG thirteen. Um, wow. But, uh, I think, or no, it got an R rating without, um, any graphic violence or sex. Like it was just because of how scary it was because the atmosphere Hmm. they built, but there's this really great one shot kind of doing the same thing, similar to what he did here with that fight sequence where it's a lot of that spinning camera. And technically in this, it's not a single take. We kind of know that it's sort of. It's patching together and visual effects to right. create that illusion. Mm-hmm. But I love the way that that looks. And he did something kind of similar in The Conjuring. He's really good visually. I think he he comes up with some really interesting things. Um, he did some he really is an excellent director. Yeah, I'd like um, to see him do more more uh, superhero movies. Well, I mean, he did the second Aquaman um, as well. In fact, yes. He did a horror movie in between the two called Malignant that I I enjoyed because it was just bonkers, like it was it was just a crazy <laughs> concept and a and a completely nutso idea. Um, mm-hmm. But he's he uh, his other one would be Furious Seven, which I am eventually going to be watching. Um, about uh, I, I have a I have a I've thing seen that. I have a thing where I might be start watching all the Fast and Furious movies because I've only ever seen the first one, but. He's got a good eye. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Um, because I agree with you. He's got a great eye. Uh, and and he understood how to visually do this movie because I think it looks really good. I think 
Um, the costuming was the, unique to it as well. Everything about the visuals was really good. The this the special effects were good. The CGI was good. The you know the 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 composition of scenes and and transitions and stuff was really all of it was really really good for this movie. I also think he went into it with the right attitude, right? He didn't try to make it this, you know, fantastic, uh, cinematic, you know, masterpiece. He went into it making it a, you know, a, a entertaining superhero movie. Yeah. And and that and he pulled it off. Yeah, and they did like all of the underwater stuff was dry for wet. So it was it was everybody harnessed up to float around the sets and Obviously, because yeah, um, not actually. I've seen a couple of interviews where they said that was actually quite uh, challenging. Oh yeah, and hard to do. Um, That they were they were just hanging in these things. Every once in a while, they'd have to push them. Yep, guys in the green suits and stuff, (laughs) (laughs) which which is pretty funny. (laughs) I'm just imagining like grips in green suits with like a broom handle, just pushing them out of the way or moving them where they need to go. And they're trying and they're. They said one of the hardest things that they had to do was was to try to mimic motions in the water mm-hmm. and yet give their dialogue in a normal normal cadence. Right. I, and, and I was I actually was trying to do it and I couldn't do it. It was <laughs> it was something you would really have to practice moving slower or like you were you know had resistance in the water mm-hmm. and still speak in a normal normal tone. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was that's really interesting about that. I did find a couple of times where the CGI, like with the hair floating or something like that, was a little wonky. Mm-hmm. I hated um, um, uh, um, Mara uh, Atlanta's hair. I hated the red hair. Oh, I don't know why. It just I didn't hate like the or, red sorry, Mira's hair. Yeah, I just it just. My problem with her hair... And I know it's red in the comics. I I understand. (laughs) It was too red. My problem with her hair wasn't the color, because I think the color worked, because it's underwater, and there's going to be something bright and vibrant in it. It it works off of the suit that she was wearing a lot, because she wore a lot of green, so the green and red worked for me. My -hmm. problem with it was, because her hair is long, it was inconsistent in the CG for when it's underwater. Um... Because she basically existed in three states in this movie. She was either underwater where her hair was flowing around, and it was inconsistent in that part. Like, sometimes it would look really short comparatively um, with just the way that they had it oh, kind of right. framed out, and oh, other okay. times it looked longer. Mm-hmm. Or she was there was two sections where she was on land and it was dry, and that was in the Sahara and then Sicily. And the rest of the time, she was just... Like they would hose her down before takes, basically, because she was having <laughs> just walked out of the water, so her hair is right. wet. Um, so all of the stuff on land, I think, worked okay. It was, and it's hard. Like hair is difficult to do anyway. I mean, hair's hard, anyways. Yeah, and they had a lot of it to do with her. They had uh, Dolph Lundgren's hair wasn't long, but it was a little bit longer, so they got a little bit of that flow. Obviously, Momoa's got those. Mm-hmm those flowing locks of his. So it made sense to have Patrick Wilson have his slicked. Same with Willem Dafoe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a lot easier on them. But yeah, I, I will agree that, that that was the one spot where the VFX didn't always look completely on point. And it's no, you know, no shame on the VFX artist. That's they did not the, her fault. Not, no. That was no. beside her acting <laughs> portion. That was that, that hair just sort of sort of put me off too. It's very bright. It's very red. Um, it was very very red. But as as someone who yes. has had bright blue, green, purple hair, I I, I can get behind it. Um, yeah, it was a person that hasn't had hair for <laughs> some reasons. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just the visuals. Any. I also loved the underwater stuff, like going into Atlantis and all the the neon, you know, those those bioluminescent mm-hmm. colors that they would have under there uh, was great. It did give me very strong, um, and I'm sure there's no way it wasn't a little bit of an influence, uh, at least 
because it was so popular, Thor Ragnarok. I got some of those feels in here. Yeah, when it when we they first went into um Atlantis, I definitely got a Star Wars were on Coruscant type mm -hmm. of vibe. It was like yeah. we we're gonna pull this straight out of Star Wars <laughs> and stick it in this movie. <laughs> Although it, that did have my favorite bit of music, that synthy music they had coming into Atlantis. I loved that. I thought that was really cool. Because yes. it's that alien feel. Oh, did you feel. catch? Yeah, did you catch the octopus? Yes. Playing drums. That was fantastic. I was like, I was like, did I really see that? And I like backed it up. I was like, I did. Look at that. <laughs> so, and that is a actual character from the comics of Aquaman. It was his pet That's octopus. Not to the comics, yeah. Yep, it's... Topo. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. Which yeah, I, I was like, that's great that they actually got that. Yeah, because they didn't have Aqua Dog. I thought there were, but we sort of they did, did not have Aqua Dog. Because I mean, but but his dad does have a golden retriever, so we sort of got a pseudo Aqua Dog uh, at the beginning. Yeah, um, sort of. Yeah, there. I I thought there were quite a few pop culture nods mm -hmm. in oh, different sure. different spots in the movie. You you could some of them I got, some of them I was had to go look up later on but i may have um, uh recorded one in my audio clips that was a little pop culture no, reference but i that, did catch that the octopus. i thought that was really cool it was really it was <laughs> like atlantis itself looked really cool i kind of wish we'd been able to spend more time there um yes yeah but it's that i'm hoping they're going to do that in a new movie in the in the new movie which is coming to hbo max i think it hits hbo max hey they hit today Oh, well, it's, I'm sure it's soon. Um, or maybe in the next couple of days, it's it's going to hit HBO Max. Okay, good. Because I, I have not seen that one yet. I did not get out to, to see it in the theater, so I do want to watch it. Um, I haven't even, I haven't been to a theater in Star Wars. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's the last thing I saw in the okay. theater. <laughs> I've been back going to, going to theaters here and there, um, so I've enjoyed that. But yeah, um, I'm curious to see if we spend more time uh, because anything underwater is always tougher to do, right? Like that's just logistically. Yeah. I mean, we just talked about like the actors themselves have a harder time with it because of everything. So you end up with uh those pockets of air underwater or whatever, which is fine. That's a good storytelling technique. Um, I thought that was a good um a good way to handle it too, where that will create you know pockets of air so that we can have normal normal movement and, and interaction yeah and speech i do like that they made them just able to talk underwater um because if you remember in justice yeah. league they had to create a bu air bubble to talk and right. that seemed a little silly to me because like you live underwater you'd be able to talk underwater so they just yeah you would think that beings that that that's their home they would be able to speak or communicate in some way yeah underwater yeah um but i did i i enjoyed just that slight modulation to everybody's voice when they're underwater it's a little bit lower yep and it had a little warble to it because you could hear sort of the sound waves having to work harder to get through the water i liked that yeah it was um, a nice little detail mm -hmm. that they put in um i liked the music overall but like i say the synth music part of it um was my favorite stuff the the orchestral score wasn't there wasn't like a big theme that I, that I felt like there wasn't that sort of, you know, Avengers has that fanfare that you, as well, soon yeah, as you hear I, it, you know, and, and that, um, I didn't get that here, but yeah, I didn't think there was any one piece of music that really stood out to me at all. What I mean, which is fine. Most of the time it's just background stuff anyways. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, unless you've got the movie where it's very prominent, you know, like, well, I always come back to Star Wars, right? Star Wars, the very beginning, the first yep. thing you hear is those, you know, the chords of the Imperial March. It's like, you know, that's the very first thing you hear. Yeah. Um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is another one, you know, that music's playing as he's running through the tunnel. And you, everybody knows that, that music by now. Yep. Uh, so there's things like that. But I didn't really pick out any, any specific pieces of music that caught my eye. Um, cut my ear in this movie 
No, nothing, nothing that stood out for me. Uh, but it, but it was very fitting. It all, it all fit the mode, the mode and the theme of. Yeah, nothing was, was out of on. place either. Right. Uh, even down to like some of the um, uh, licensed music that they'd throw in there, like the whatever cover of that incorporated Africa when they go to the Sahara, um, which <sighs> maybe a touch on the nose, but that's fine. I, you know. I was, yeah, I was fine was, with uh, it. I think it was Pitbull. Pitbull oh, that's did right. the uh, cover of, of Toto's Africa when they dropped in. Sarah. That was that was sort of interesting and funny. <laughs> um, the mu- music was Rupert Gregson Williams who did that. I don't know him off. Like, I don't recognize the name, uh, but hmm. he did the Wonder Woman score, which I will say Wonder Woman, I think, had better music personally. Um, there was something. I, no, see, Wonder Woman, you definitely noticed the music, but I yeah. think there was maybe some more cinematic style scenes in Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things in the in in the um, home world, the home city of of uh, oh, Wonder uh, Woman. Yeah, there, there were some more you know grandiose style scenes in that movie. And it had a had more of a motif. The music fit more of a motif yeah. in that than it did in here, where it was just supporting everything here. Uh, but that's fine, you know. And I don't I don't need everything yeah. to have that instantly iconic music if the visuals are good, if what what I'm seeing works and the story is working. Which the story overall I liked. The story is very. Um, it's funny because it's Arthur Curry, so they went very Arthurian with the story as well. Yes, you know, mm-hmm. he's got a. Yeah. He's got to unite the kingdom, so he's got to go out and get the thing instead of Excalibur. It's the Trident, and um, yeah. I when this movie worked for me, it really did. Like the adventure stuff, um, I liked them going places, um, and then it just like I say, there's like it's going, 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 and then there's that stretch where we have the big fight in Sicily. And then there's five minutes on the boat and then a big fight on the boat and then under mm-hmm. the water. Um, and those right. creatures, the trench, by the way, um, those things were right. nasty. Like Those are cool. They were really those cool. Those were one of the better creatures I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> those were really cool. Those were like um, alien, alien creature cool. Yeah. Or very, uh, very creature from the Black Lagoon inspired too. You could kind of, yes. you could. You very could very good. Feel that in there. They were great, and that was more brutal than I thought. Like, yes, and well, and, and being a horror horror movie um, director, mm-hmm. he you probably has it. some experience with coming up with good, good creatures, sure. <laughs> right? So, yeah, you could see his horror movie roots in the in that scene um, on the boat at night. Yeah, and... absolutely on the boat. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and that led us all through like a big, big action sequence down in the water and the swarms of them coming after them. I thought was really cool. And then they end up in the um, center of the earth, right? In the Jules Verne mm-hmm. style prehistoric center of the earth, which was like, okay, sure. Yep. Why? Like, we'll, sus- we'll suspend belief for that one. <laughs> look, we're in a movie we'll with have that one. <laughs> a race of people that can breathe underwater. <laughs> yeah. I'm not it's not a step too far. Like it's not a bridge too far at that it point. It is not. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, and I loved having uh, the, this was my favorite cameo in the movie. I loved this. Oh, oh yeah. The, uh, for the, um, oh, what did they call the creature? Um, Cause it wasn't a Kraken. Uh, uh, not Kraken, but it's a uh, Krakaton. Krakathin, I think is what they called it. Krakathin. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yes, when my I, favorite cameo in the movie. I was so surprised. And I was like, this is Carathin. fantastic. Carathon. That's what it was. Um, and uh, it's Julie Andrews as the voice yes. of the Carathon. How great is that? Um, there were that three. Was fantastic. There were three great voice cameos. Um, two of them, I feel like you could have put just about anybody in the roles and it wouldn't have changed anything. Because like the Carathon. It's a very important scene, so to put a, a very recognizable voice there, I think works. And then to have it be Julie Andrews of all mm-hmm. people is kind of brilliant for this right. giant, one of the you know the giants of 
of acting yeah to do that yes and and this giant like grotesque kraken cthulhu like creature and it's got a you know a crazy modulated voice but it's julie andrew's voice that's very melodic and very soothing uh yeah. was was really cool um the other two were and you probably read this but um did you recognize him at the time john reese davies was the I Brian did not. king yep yeah i did read that after the fact but he did not recognize it at the time i made sure to go into this and not know a whole lot about who was in it sure other than you know the main main four or five mm -hmm. people um so those were pleasant surprises uh, and for me, that's a voice that I recognize immediately just because, I mean, he was Sala, he was Gimli, he, um, I love sliders. I like his voice quite a bit. He's got that booming type of voice. So when yeah. I hear it, I'm like, oh yeah, it's John Reese davies but he's barely in the movie. Um, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. I do love though. I, I have a fondness for IMDB trivia because you sometimes have to wonder when the people are writing this trivia, <laughs> this one is right up there. It's like, this is John Reese Davies fifth comic book role. Okay. Fifth comic book role. But here are the other roles he was in the trial of oh, the God. incredible Hulk. If you remember that TV movie from 1989. Wow. That's been a long, that's a long time ago. Okay. He yeah. was Wilson Fisk. He was the kingpin in the trial of the incredible Hulk. Oh, okay. Um, he was in the, right. the Cape and Cowl Conspiracy in 1992, um, which I don't think anyone's wow. seen. Uh, no. He was in Fantastic Four, the animated series in 1994. Okay, that I've seen. Yeah. And. That, that was in the wheelhouse. <laughs> and possibly my favorite one because it's another TV movie, but he was in the 2001 Justice League movie which is I'm pretty certain nobody saw. Because um, did you remember there was a Justice was League a movie? Justice Le <laughs> no, there was a Justice League movie in 2001? Really? There was. For and TV? Yeah, I have seen clips and I have seen screen caps of it. I've never watched it. It's... Wow. It's something. Is it uh, bad? It looks pretty bad. Um, it looks wow. on the level of... Was it, it the Roger Corman Is it Star Fantastic Wars Christmas Four. special bad or <laughs> it's that Fantastic Four Roger Corman level look to it. Right? Like if you've ever oh, seen okay. if you've ever seen that. There... Yeah. Um mm -hmm. and it has it looks exact like just the costumes are garish and very cheap looking wow. and all this. So mm. <laughs> I just I had to laugh at that because those are all the right. So, so there's that, right? There's John. Those are the five comic book roles John Reese Davies has been in, including this one. Right above that, so he's in the, been in one. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> right above that in the trivia is um, King Riku of the Fishmen was voiced by Jaiman Hansu, who again is in the movie for about a minute. Right, he's there to yeah. speak a couple of lines, get killed by King Orm, and that's it. <laughs> But it's Jaiman Hansu. And he, on the other hand, has been, he's King Riku in this, but he was in Shazam as Shazam. In the movie? Yeah. He played the wizard Shazam. Oh, oh right. Okay. Um, yeah. So he's he's in that. He's also in Constantine, which was a DC-based movie, uh, as Papa Midnight. Um, and he's done Marvel movies. He was um, uh, Korath in Guardians of the Galaxy and Captain Marvel. So it's just <clears> funny to have him pop up here. So like the the IMDb trivia cracks me up because here you got Jaiman Hansu was in and they name four big budget Hollywood comic book movies. <laughs> John Reese davies was in made for TV stuff from 20 and 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, I, my, uh, my IMDb rabbit holes are I'll look at a movie and then I'll look at a person and look at all their movies and then oh, yeah. click on a movie and then look <laughs> at all the people in that one. And the next thing you know, I'm 13 movies in and yep. you know, about 20 actors and yeah, got yeah. 37 you, tabs open. You, you started off looking at Aquaman <laughs> and next thing you know, you're on like only the strong from 1993. And you're like, how did I end up here? It's a it's six degrees of Kevin well, I went Bacon. To, one of them was I wanted to see the, the horror movies that, uh, 
uh, Juan had done. And oh yeah, it's <laughs> like wow. It's uh, they they all James Wan for me. Now I haven't seen Furious Seven, um, but I've watched all of the Conjuring stuff. Um, I've watched all of the Conjurings and the Annabelles and all of that. And he's involved mm-hmm. in a lot of those, and he directed a, a few of them. They're, for the most part, pretty good. Like, there's obviously any franchise is going to be weaker entries, but those first yeah. couple of Conjuring movies, they're really good horror movies. Um, he 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 has yeah he has a style. He's very good at what he does, and so it was interesting to see him come to this because it's kind of like um, it's kind of like learning that Peter Jackson started off in these schlocky, gross-out horror movies before doing Lord of the Rings. And right. Yeah. But then when you watch Lord of the Rings, there's those scenes in the in those movies where you're like, "Oh yeah, this guy got you started can in tell. horror." Oh, right. <laughs> like he knows, mm-hmm. he knows that part of things. Yeah. Um so that was really cool here. Um Yeah, I just it, it's it's fun. That's the thing that this movie needed and the DC my biggest problem with DC's movies is a tonal issue where they can't quite figure out what tone they want or they latch on to a tone and stick with it too much. Like, obviously Marvel figured out a formula that worked for them and they kind of stuck to that with slight variations here and there. Whether you still like that formula or not, they've been able to continue to churn that out. DC had... Right. D- DC had these things where it's all under the Warner Brothers umbrella, but wildly different takes on stuff. And I, d- I never liked the overly dour nature of Zack Snyder's movies. I think as a visual director, he can be very interesting visuals wise, but he had that yeah. grim, dark look and that can work for some characters, but it doesn't work for Superman. Superman shouldn't be. Yeah, you can't do Superman that dark and gritty. No, it does. He um, needs to be a beacon way. of hope. He, he needs, needs to, to be. Done. Yeah, and and they tried to do Wonder Woman that way too, and it didn't work at all. Just just didn't. I still have to see Wonder Woman 1984, but the first Wonder Woman I did enjoy. I would say 90 percent of that. There's some parts in it. It gets a little bogged down at its end, where it becomes like every other right. big budget movie. But yeah. like that mm-hmm. first Wonder Woman, I think worked. A lot better. It worked better than Man of Steel. And the problem with Man of Steel had nothing to do with anybody in the movie. It was just the tone of it. Didn't no, it. not at all. And then, was, on, yeah. And then on top of that, they they tried because Marvel was able to basically back the horse of Iron Man. That hit huge, and that gave them the leeway and the 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 credibility and everything to build a cinematic universe. And right, DC, and then and then they did hit, they hit a couple of of you know ones out of the park too. You mm-hmm. know, then they, you know, those there were three or four movies there in a row that were just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and, and so fact, that gave them enough enough cred to keep going. Yeah, and and it helped that they were able to do four standalone movies before their first team up of any kind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So you get your kind of three, like, yeah, there's bits and pieces here and there of like other characters showing up, but it's all, you know, Iron Man is about Iron Man and yep. Captain America, the first Avenger is about Cap. And yes, you've got Red Skull in there and Bucky is in there and you got the Howling Commandos, but it's Cap's movie. Thor is about Thor and yes, Hawkeye appears, but he's right. a cameo. And even putting Black Widow and Iron Man too, all of that stuff it's still their their individual movies. Then they all team up, and then you can start really expanding things. DC had Man of Steel, and then they're like, "Well, we got to catch up with Marvel." So immediately they go to Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. Right. And while the extended version of that is considerably better, I have watched that. That's the like, I don't know if you've seen that that cut or not. It's two and a half. I have seen the extend, extended okay. extended version is better. Yeah, it's it's better. It still was. Too much, too quickly. We we met Superman in one movie. We got his story, and then immediately we've got Superman versus Batman with Wonder Woman showing up, and we're going to give you cameos of, uh, you know, Aquaman and um, the Flash and Cyborg 
so that our third movie is all of them teaming up. Mm -hmm. It's too much too quickly, and you don't get... Right. By Justice League, like, because we don't have any of their standalone movies ahead of time, we don't know Aquaman or Cyborg. We don't care as an, as an audience in that particular right. story, unless you are a diehard of fan of Cyborg, him showing up in Justice League is like, who's this? I don't know who this is. So... Yeah, I was just I was just going to say that. It was <laughs> that, you know, Marvel, you knew the characters. You already had them. You already loved the characters. Let's put them together in a movie. Mm -hmm. DC just sort of said, all right, everybody knows Superman. We're going to, you know, put him in the movie. And we're going we're gonna to put everybody in the movie now. And you didn't have any any ties to those characters. Nope. And so there, there's just no way for me to connect with that. And, like, I don't need to have, like, make Man of Steel. I would make a different movie um, than what they made. But, like, make a Superman movie. And you can make a Wonder Woman movie. You can make a Batman movie. It doesn't have to be an origin, right? Batman can already be mm -hmm. established. We don't need that. Um, and then you bring them all together. And when you bring them together, maybe because that's the other part I think that was rough is like the Avengers were it was Cap, Iron Man, and Thor with Hulk, who works better as a supporting character, I think, anyway, for the most part. Although I like we talked about it when you were on yeah. the show before. I liked the I Incredible like him. Hulk. Yeah. I like the Incredible Hulk. I thought yeah. it was a good movie. Uh, he's also one of my favorite characters, <laughs> so that helps. But like to uh, have him them, and, him and actually, actually, I love Fantastic Four. I think that's a great concept for a group, you know, a superhero group. Mm -hmm. By the I way, I think it's a great concept. You saw it's the it's been poorly done, and yeah, you saw the the casting this past week, right? For fan, the new yeah. Fantastic Four. Oh, I'm excited. They've oh, got me please. because that was. Yes. That was four actors cast in that movie that I absolutely adore. I mean, Pedro Pascal, he's... he's Well, he can do no wrong right now. Yeah, he is just the <laughs> darling uh, right now. And then um, yep. Fantastic Four, I want to see... Oh, Vanessa Kirby. He, he is... Yeah, he's in my favorite show of, of TV for the last couple of years. Last of Us? Last of Us was just phenomenal. Yeah, I thought it was incredible. Just unbelievably well done. Um, and he's great. He's just great. I think he will... Some yeah. people don't love the character of Reed Richards uh, from the comics, which I get. It's sort of like um, Hank Pym. Reed Richards and Hank Pym have yeah. been troubled in the comics. We'll put it that way. But I think Pedro as Reed is a great choice. Vanessa Kirby as Sue. I love Vanessa Kirby. She's She's incredible. Mm -hmm. I cannot She's wait great. to see Joseph Quinn as Johnny because I loved him in Stranger Things and I'm really curious to see where he goes with a character like Johnny Storm um, and it not being because he initially I wouldn't think of him as Johnny Storm because of like Chris Evans playing the role but then the more I thought about it the more it makes sense he kind of fits the role of Johnny Storm a little bit. And I'm also very curious to see how they do Ben Grimm. Uh, but Eben uh, Moss yes. Backrack is amazing. I loved him. This is going to be a second Marvel thing because he was great in Punisher. Did you did you watch mm -hmm. those? Yeah. You watched the Netflix Punisher or um, Netflix Defender stuff, I, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, he was in uh, season yes, one. He was very good in that. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm just I'm um, really yes. Yeah, so really when I saw the lineup, I was like, "There's one you could you could have had Vanessa Kirby as as Mira. Ooh. I think that would have worked better. Yeah, she would have been good. She would have been real good. She'd have been really good. Yeah, I I you know what you've convinced you you nailed it there. She would have been great as Mira, and she's the right age. Yeah, too. she would have been perfect. Because mm -hmm. I was thinking about because I saw Madame yeah. Webb. Uh, which I didn't hate. Madam Webb was fine. Um, oh, really? You're the first person I've heard to seen it that said they didn't hate it. <laughs> I, I'm i very forgiving of movies, um, which I understand, but I thought there was... What carried it for me was um, the four leads. 
those four women were so good together. Their chemistry was really good. Um, the the story was bleh, and the villain was terrible. Uh, I hated the villain because he was like mm-hmm. we talked. So mentioning how Black Manta in in this movie in Aquaman was kind of very. We don't know anything about him. He's just a pirate. Very superfluous. Superfluous, yeah. but also mm-hmm. we don't learn enough about him because he's just a pirate. But that's fine. He's a he's an ambitious pirate, and he gets on the wrong side of stuff. Okay, cool. In Madam Web, the villain is like a plot device. He's just there to be a bad guy, and he's the only villain in the mm. whole movie. And he just speaks in cliches, and it's just not not well executed at all. So, you know. Uh, where Aquaman had two villains, both of whom were cast great and performed great. Uh, Madam Web had zero that were that were well done. So, oh, I, f- I want to mention yeah. also in uh, in Aquaman, the kid that plays young Arthur Curry, because there was there were they used twins for him as a as a toddler as like a three year old, mm-hmm. and uh, and they so that the was kid cool. in the aquarium or the one that was a little bit older. The the kidney aquarium was great, but the one that was a little bit older, like around thirteen or so, when he's training with yes. Volko, he was uh-huh. so good. And yep, holy crap, did they cast somebody who could pass for a young Jason Momoa? And I bought that he was Tamara Morrison's kid. Like he gave me that feel. Yes. That I have look. it in my notes. I have it in my notes that the teenage the teenage Arthur was just phenomenal, well acted. And perfectly cast. Mm-hmm. Just Absolutely. All of it. Just the way he was like, why doesn't my mom love me? And and I'm tired of your crap. It was just, it was perfect. It was so well acted. It really, really and was. And he was the perfect, he was the perfect person to pick for it. Yep. Yeah. I have that in my notes here. It's like, make sure you mention this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the younger one was fine. Um I yeah. thought that those scenes were really good um, to give some context to to his personality. Mm-hmm. But that one was of note to yeah. me was was how good he was. And actually, I'm hoping to see him again somewhere. Yeah, that kid was good. Um, and he uh, was really good. Is Otis? Uh, I'm gonna go with Donji. Um, I may be mispronouncing that, but that's it's D H A N J I. So Donji sounds right. Um, and looks yeah Arr, i just saw him in a movie this past year called talk to me which is a little australian oh, i haven't film. seen that i it's on our it's, list boy, it's, it's on a, our list it's a creepy one um but it's good it's real good uh but yeah he was in that he had a he had a role in there so that's that makes sense now um I don't remember offhand where he was, but he must have been one of the kids just kind of hanging out. Um, but yeah, he uh, I loved him in this. So that was that was cool to see. Because um, again, it's, it's always tough when you cast younger versions of somebody, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because you got to have them look enough like the person. And in this case, they just, they nailed that. Like, I don't know who, how they found this kid, but he looked like a young Jason Momoa. Right, yeah. And we've seen young Jason Momoa, too. So, like, we know what he looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I I agree with you. This movie is fun. Is it, like, a great film in terms of uh, cinema, if you want to go that (laughs) route? No, it's not. But most most comic book-based things aren't. And they don't need to be. I don't need and I, every And movie. I actually wish more movies would take this tact. Mm-hmm. Just make it fun. It was... Um, I had the same thought, so I were, saw... There I were s- ones or two... Oh, go ahead. There were one or two times, though, that where I was like, is Momoa looking at the camera? <laughs> is he, like, <laughs> winking at us? <laughs> there were a couple of times where I was like, he just turns and gives his little... little you know, grin, and I'm like, is, is he like going breaking the fourth wall here, and and yeah. just looking at the audience? He was <laughs> he was towing that line for sure. That's why, and people have said this for a few years, and I completely buy it. He would be a perfect casting for Lobo, if they ever do a Lobo movie. 
Oh, God, yes. Oh, absolutely. Because he's absolutely. got the look, but he also has that... Like, Lobo has to have epic levels of charisma, right? It's got to be... And Momoa is on that yeah. level of charisma, like a Dwayne Johnson and those types, where he just... Mm -hmm. He just exudes... Like, you just want to hang out with the dude. He just seems like a genuinely cool guy. And... But he's got to have that that little bit of impishness to him yeah. that Momoa does, right? Yes, Lobo. He, he's needs... got to have that to him too, mm -hmm. which I don't think Johnson doesn't have that. No, it's a di he's got a different type of charisma, but it's that level of charisma. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah. Momoa has got that little bit of a smirk, that little bit of a wink, where you're like, "Ooh, mm -hmm. he might be a little crazy," and like <laughs> that works. Cause like, he's, he's the kind of dude you want to go party with, right? Oh, absolutely. You want to, you want to go to a luau or, or some type of, of of a pool party with that dude because he's just going to be fun. Yeah. Yep. He is. You, you know you're going to have a good time. And what I like, too, is how candid he is about, um, like, uh, he, there was an interview I saw with him where he was like, I hate working out. I was like, yeah, I do it for the movies, but... <laughs> When I'm on my own, I don't want to work out. He does it because he has to weights. and he has an image. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, but, if, but if I have my choice, I'm just going to sit around, drink beer, eat pizza. I don't care. And like, I like mm -hmm. that because it's 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 honest. He's like, I, I do this. It and, is. And I, I, I it's an image to have, but I don't, it's not, I don't define myself by it, which I, I really appreciate. Um. And yeah. he's just, he's funny too. He's got great delivery. I mean, I, I captured some audio. I got to play because it was interesting watching it again with the idea of capturing some audio. There was a lot of stuff where I was like, oh, this is just sort of not interesting to, to capture. Like it doesn't work as an audio clip. Mm -hmm. it's, it works in the context of the movie. But like I said, so, sort of toward the beginning, there's a good amount of like exposition delivery style dialogue. Um, but there are some moments that are great when, so this one, this first one is in that fight sequence in the submarine, um, when he's fighting with Manta and I love that because he's just beating the brakes off this dude and he's like, let's not make this a habit. And then he turns <laughs> around and there's, there's Manta's dad with the grenade launcher and hits him with that grenade. And it's a really cool visual effect shot of that grenade hitting him and exploding and throwing him across. It was, yeah. And I love, like, he ends up face down and they're looking at him and the camera shows him and he's, like, sizzling, which I thought was, that just made me laugh. Yeah. Just that sound. <laughs> the, the sound design in the movie was really good. Like, we mentioned the voice modulation yes. stuff mm -hmm. underwater, but, like, the overall sound design was very top-notch. Um, but yeah. he's... He's See, sizzling. He up and say, ow. Yeah. So he's sizzling. He gets up and he looks at him and he just says, ow. It's like. It's, yes, it was great. It's such a <laughs> great delivery. I actually, Yeah, I laughed out loud then. I was like, that's fantastic. <laughs> so that one I had to get. That's just a great sound clip. Uh, um, and I mentioned this earlier, but Tamara Morrison, awesome. So good. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and he and Momoa had a great chemistry and when he sees him and they embrace, you know, and they're giving the big hug, he's like, come on, I'll buy you breakfast. And then we smash cut to them just putting down what looked like pitcher sized mugs of beer. Yeah. Um, so that scene in the bar was excellent. Oh, it was where good. the guy comes up and he's like, you know, you think he's going to, you know, get in his face and he's like can i take a picture <laughs> yeah and and then, and then the pictures go from a mo like oh yeah whatever to you know they're all pounding beers and having <laughs> yeah. a good time i'm like you know that's exactly how it would go 100 <laughs> percent. exactly how it would go if you ran into him in a bar and ask him that <laughs> in fact if you told me that those pictures were just them hanging out and they decided to throw it in the movie i would believe you um, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But I love, I absolutely love when he, he takes a big drink and he sets the mug down and then Momoa is trying to drink and you just get this from from Tom, from Tamara Morrison. You want me to have them put that in a sippy cup for you? And the, <laughs> the breath and like that, that laugh. Because 
I have a feeling like that that had to have been an ad lib, and that was a genuine laugh, and he almost inhaled beer. Um, it was so good. You want me to have them put that? You want me to have them put that in a sippy cup for you? Oh, no, 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 that's great. So well delivered. Um, so there was that one. Um, I also like I like this just because it's a silly thing to say, and some people might not love um, some of the quips. I don't mind them. I think they're fun. Uh, I don't mind them. And and this one was one of the better ones. This is when, so Mara and him are on their way to Atlantis. She's convinced him to go, and she opens up that that door and she's like, "Here's my sh you know my my ship that we're gonna go in," and just this. Your fish ship has been marinated in chum butter. I'm gonna come out smelling like swamp butt. That'd be an improvement. Coming out smelling like swamp butt. <laughs> Uh, it works for me. <laughs> okay, so so I had this discussion with my wife. If they can swim supersonically in water, why do they need chips? <laughs> so I thought that too. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. They could just they could literally swim there. They have the ability to. But here was where I was able to justify it to myself. Um, he's never been to Atlantis. They have to go in. She has to basically sneak him into Atlantis. Right. So that's where it comes from. She's well, got right. diplomatic. Yeah, and then, well, so her yes, diplomatic when they got there and had the dialogue about, yeah. about I'm getting us in, it made sense. But yeah, when they were when they were going, I was like, they can both swim really fast. Why are they taking a yeah taking exactly? A ship? <laughs> yes, maybe they just get tired. It's they too far. There. They they you know it's like doing a mile swim. You it get is tired possible. after a while. Um, but yeah. Okay, so here was one of the pop culture references uh, that I caught, and I just liked it because I thought it was a it was a good one. Uh, it's him talking to uh, Volko, and this is when he, this is after he has challenged King Orm, and Volko comes in and is like. You know, basically telling him, what are you doing? Why did, why did you do that? And he's, uh, this is right after he has the line where he's like, I don't know. I figure I just kick his butt and then you, I go home and everybody's happy. And he goes, well, you know, the, the, you can't do that. And he goes, you taught me how to fight Cobra Kai. I like that. You taught me how to fight Cobra Kai. <laughs> yes. That's a good one. And Volko's like, uh, I don't know who this Cobra Kai person is, but... Yes. I liked that. Yeah, I, that was that was pretty cool. Um I said there were quite a few of them throughout the Yeah. Oh yeah. throughout the movie. Um and that's that that's that was sort of what what our theme has been, right? It, it's it's nice that it was just sort of fun. Yeah. A fun movie. Yeah, you want you want fun. Like um here's another great delivery from Momoa. Um and this is when they're, this is after the fight and they're leaving in Mara's ship and they're being chased. What's up? We got a bogey on our six. What does that even mean? Back guys behind us. They just say that. Back guys behind us. It's that last bit where he's, <laughs> his voice squeaks. <laughs> that, that means behind us. <laughs> that got me. That really did. Like, I yes. loved the, what does that even mean? And he's like, bad guys behind us. And she goes, just say that. It's the second time. He's bad guys behind us. He's all scared. I loved it. Oh, that <laughs> that cracked me up. I di I did like though that there were certain there were little things, little tidbits like that that were sort of the difference between the different worlds, mm -hmm. and they sort of put those in there in those certain spots to show that they were bringing two yeah. two worlds together. Yeah, I think it, without the Manta stuff, they could have spent more time with that too. I think that's the other part of it. And it's tough, right? When you're doing an origin story and you spend so much time with him yeah. younger and the whole, I mean, the first 15 minutes, um, he's not really even in the movie. And so it's harder to establish some of that stuff. But yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Or even, again, this is Momoa just being Moa, And it's right after she rips the door off that plane and just jumps out of it in the Sahara. And uh, <laughs> the pilot... The pilot reacts like, "Did she just jump without a parachute?" And I just love redheads. You gotta love them. And jumps out himself. <laughs> now, there is my other sort of, and it, this is indicative of of all comic book movies to an extent. Uh, but I feel like DC maybe did this just a 
touch more, although Marvel's guilty of it too. He can take some punishment, and and she can too. Like these characters are nigh on indestructible, and yeah. it's hard to create stakes well, at that point. Yes, I mean he did get hit with a grenade in the yeah. chest, <laughs> right? And, and you know it was fine. <laughs> yep, he jumped out of a plane and fell, presumably thousands of feet. Because uh, I can't imagine they were flying that low. Yeah. Um, I was into a sand dune. It was. That's true. And he did, you know, he tucked and rolled. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah. And it look, it's, it's the, it's the thing that happens in all action movies and especially comic book movies. Your characters are, because you need something visually interesting. So they've got to be taking huge hard hits. Um, right. It's, yeah. it's the, um, it's like, when you go back and you watch, say, Die Hard, for instance, as an action movie, there's a lot of action in there. But by the end of that, John McClane is beat to hell and he's not moving super quick. Yes. You know, the, the what what quickness he has, you can tell is just adrenaline and then that wears off. But by like the third and fourth, by the fourth Die Hard movie, part of my problem with that was he became a superhero. He could take way too much damage. Yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah. it's it's fine. I when I'm watching a superhero based property, I tend to shut that part of my brain off anyway. Like that's fine. They're going to give us something that will give some stakes to it. Um, but yeah, like (laughs) when Manta's surviving what he survived, you know, that's the thing. Um, I did like, so when they, when they fake their crash and then they leave in the whale, when he calls the whale over and they get in the mouth and oh, he's like, right. it's Pinocchio mm-hmm. and they, and they take off. I liked the callback to that when she gets the Pinocchio book from the little girl in Sicily. Oh and, yes. <laughs> right. And she goes to him. And she's like, you risked our lives based on something you read in a children's book. You risked our lives based on something. <laughs> yes. And, and the best part of that is 100% the His reaction. comeback is even better. Oh, it's a book? Huh, <laughs> look at that. I did it from the movie. Like, that's so perfect. And it fits Arthur yes. to a T. So, yeah, I love that. That was that was just some some sound clips from the movie I, I, I had fun with. Um, it, I'm glad you got to watch this because I do think this is what a popcorn movie should be. A popcorn movie yes, should just absolutely. be fun. Yeah. And just fun. Like... It's unrealistic, it's outrageous, and I get that. But the world they establish the world and the rules, and they for the most part stick with it. Like there isn't a there isn't any kind of weird power leveling where um or power scaling or anything like that. Like everybody's on the same level. You know, Arthur can take a whole lot of punishment, but so can Orm. It's not like one of right. them can take yeah. more than the other. Mara can take all that same kind of punishment. Like all of those characters can, so it works. Um, so, and and it's again fun, and the the visuals look good. They don't look overly rushed. Some of the hair underwater that's really really difficult to do. Yeah, I so. mean there were there were a couple of effects that were a little eh, but um, honestly though overall. Not that, not that bad. No, not at all. And this was a movie, you know, it was a hundred and sixty million dollar movie, so they had some budget behind it. They were able to give the effects houses time to work on it a little bit more, um, and it shows because it 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 comes off as a polished, finished movie. Um, so, like for me, this is in my top of all time. Any movie based on DC. Because I am going to go back probably to, I would say, Batman 1989 is sort of the start of that. There was a couple, there was stuff, Superman uh, is is up there. But, like, if we look when, at. When was Superman was prior? Because that was, that one was, was Reeves. That was pretty good. Uh, That was Superman 3. So that would have been 80, I want to say that's 83. Because Superman 80s, yeah. was 78. The first Superman was 1978. Yeah. Um, so if we start from there and move forward as far as DC movies go, this this probably makes my top five. 
with like uh with with um Dark Knight with Batman 89 with Superman. I like this. I like this above some of the other ones because mm-hmm. of the fun that it has. Um I put Wonder Woman up there. It's it, it, it's kind of although it's tough cuz I I actually well I like Constantine as a standalone, but based on the comic, it's okay. Yeah, if you right. if you divorce it from being based on a specific comic and you say, well, they sort of reimagine a little bit, it actually kind of works because that's fine. Um which is why I didn't dislike it. But I just think I think this movie nailed a tone that works for the character. Because you can't go grim dark with certain characters and aquaman is one of them he can't be that right he, he, he just you can make him badass which they do here he's not ridiculous you know there was the joke for a long time of like aquaman's the worst hero all he can do is talk to fish no <laughs> he can do a lot and oh honestly, well, they made they made fun of him in in movies and stuff mm-hmm. oh yeah in in dc movies they made fun of him you know what uh, Justice League is that? Where they're like, uh, you go talk to the fishes or something, and yeah, they they've they've been doing it, and this this made them like you know into a real superhero. Yeah, and I enjoyed that. And um, yeah, probably in the DC world, this would probably be in top five. Um, I mean, I, I Batman, you know, is probably number one. That that first Batman. I mean, I've of got, the trilogy was was yeah. phenomenal. I have such a uh, connection to that movie, um, so for me, I can. I know it's not perfect, but like from a nostalgia factor, it. I have much more of a connection to Batman with Michael Michael Keaton than I do with Superman. Although the Superman movies, the first three anyway, uh, are really good. Superman four, I would probably, hmm. I would put that Superman three up there with Prior in it. That was. That was exceptional. It was really good. I will tell you what, that is one of that movie has one of the scariest scenes in a non horror film I have ever seen is in Superman three. When that woman gets taken over and like turned into a robot creature at one point. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. That scarred me yeah. as a kid. Like that messed me up. <laughs> um so yeah. But yeah. Like this is fun, and right now it's streaming on Netflix and I think Max. Um, so it's on Netflix. There's a bunch of the DC stuff on Netflix for at least another week. Yeah, I think we watched it. Up. Yeah, I watched it off Netflix. It's getting ready to go away. It's getting ready. To, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's getting ready to go away because it warned us when we <laughs> yeah. fired it up that hey, this is going away. You need to watch it soon. Um, but Warner Brothers owns um, it, so it's probably gonna pop back up on Max at some point anyway. Um, if it's not already there somewhere, yeah. So it'll be available. It's it made this movie made over a billion dollars worldwide. Like it was popular. It did a it did really yeah. well. Wow, it was very popular. And, and the new the, ones come. The new ones coming to Max soon. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, definitely check that out. I'm glad you got to watch this, and it was fun to have you back. It's been too long. Yeah. I think it's been since. Uh, was it? You've been on Princess since. Uh, Bride? Was Princess Bride the first one you did, or was it? Because um, you were on for Incredible Hulk. Too. Oh, you're right. It was. Yes, it was uh, Incredible Hulk. No, was that Hulk? No, last time you were on was um, Wind Talkers. No, you came on for Cage of Palooza a couple years ago. Oh right, yes. Remember that we watched that uh, that Nick Cage mm-hmm. uh, Vietnam movie, which right. we had a fun with. But yeah, it's been which way I too enjoyed. long. Enjoyed. It was good. Yeah, yes. just yeah. Spend... Well, um, well, we'll have to do it more often because God knows a lot of movies I haven't seen. <laughs> definitely, but you've you're still Actually, doing. Have oh. you watched Oppenheimer? Because I'm that's that's next on my list is to watch Oppenheimer because I, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I did. Um, I did go and see that in the theater. I wanted to see that on the biggest screen I could, um, and I've got an IMAX here locally, so I definitely I went and watched it there. It's it's quite the thing. Um, worth worth a watch. It's a long movie, so strap in, get ready. Yes. Uh, but it's good. Um, you're still doing joystick and mouse, right? You you and J Dimes. Yes, we are. Yep. So mm-hmm. remind people about yep. that. J Dimes and I do it. We do it. 
I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Monday nights at 8.30, we record every other week. Okay. Um, just because there's not enough news in the <laughs> video game world to really, you know, uh, do that in. Um, so we record uh, Monday nights at 8.30 uh, Eastern Time. Um, the off Mondays, I'll usually be streaming something. Uh, nice. World of Warcraft, usually. Excellent. Um, and that's at... Uh, Diddy does games. Twitch.tv this slash Diddy does games. Awesome. And then as the podcast, it is joystick and mouse. And I've had you and Tim on. You guys are great. I love you both. Uh, always welcome to come back. Thank you, man. Um, super fun having you here. I do. Love re- to. Love to. Yeah. I record this show typically Sunday nights, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time over at uh, twitch.tv slash TV's Travis. And, um, but that's always subject yeah, to change. The show the show comes out on Wednesdays, though, wherever you get your podcasts. Also on YouTube as a podcast and a video. You can check it out there. Um, next week, I've got Bobby Frankenberger coming back. I haven't had him on a little while. He's never seen the movie Sideways, and I can't wait. I am excited what? to show him this movie. I know. We got talking about, because uh, there's the newer, the holdovers from Alexander Payne. And we got talking about that. And he's like, you know, I've never seen Sideways. I'm like, well, you, what, what are we doing? So so Bobby's coming back. Uh, and I can't wait. It's been uh, it's been since I made him watch Highlander a few years ago. Um, because I'm me and I make everyone watch Highlander. So it was, uh, it was <laughs> Everybody cool. Everybody should watch Highlander. I mean, agreed. Uh, so, but it was cool to to get him back. So that'll be next week. Sideways with Bobby Frankenberger. Um, I can't wait. Now, uh, you can also go to uh, tvstravis.com to find this episode, every episode of this show, other shows that I do, um, as well as if you want uh, merchandise with my silly logo on it, you can find it there. You can join the Patreon from there, or go to patreon.com/slash/wyhs and uh, support the show and my all my projects for as little as a dollar an episode. So. Um, if you want to do that, you can all do all of that at tvstravis.com. Don, thank you so much for being here. This was a ton of fun. We're not going to go three years before you're back. I'm making that declaration will, right will, now. We'll <laughs> try not to do that. Thank you for having me, sir. And uh, just uh, come on back next week, everybody, for Sideways with Bobby Frankenberger. But until then, just remember to enjoy your movies, whether at home or in the theater. And let's be excellent to each other. What's the plan? The plan was to recover Atlan's trident, then challenge Orm. Okay, so we're doing things a little out of order. Shit happens.